I once heard somebody trying to draw a distinction between popularity and importance and significance. And in that instance, they used two TV shows that you may have heard of. They aired at the same time, The Beverly Hillbillies and Star Trek, the original Star Trek series. Now, The Beverly Hillbillies was wildly popular. It ran for nine seasons and was among the, most, the top 20 most watched programs for eight of those nine seasons. However, while you may have fond memories of that show, mostly it's faded into the background, and it hasn't done a lot to shape our cultural imagination. By contrast, the original Star Trek series lasted only three seasons. It was nearly canceled after two. By the end of its first season, the viewership had dropped to 52nd out of 94 of all television programs. However, since its creation, it has expanded to multiple television series. They've spun off movies, video games, novels, comic books, and it has become the highest grossing and most recognizable media franchise, or what among them. So the Beverly Hillbillies were popular, Star Trek was significant. There's another way to think about this distinction. Perhaps you can go back in your history books and name the Prime Ministers of Canada or the Presidents of the United States, or you could look up the last number of English monarchs, you could look up the Nobel Prize winners, or think of popular celebrities. These people are important, you might say. But now think of someone who influenced you, who changed your life. Maybe it's a parent, a teacher, a friend. Maybe you have fond memories of a Sunday school teacher or a church acquaintance. These, the first folks are important in the way that the world counts these things, but the latter folks, those are significant people. John, the one who becomes known as the baptizer, his life and his witness was significant. His story casts a long shadow, and his presence fairly haunts the story of Jesus and those around him, and especially it haunts the ruler of the area, Herod. The entanglement of John's and Jesus' stories began early. When, Mary's, uh, when Mary, who was Jesus' mother, first learned of her pregnancy, the heavenly messenger who was sent to Mary in turn sends Mary to Elizabeth, a relative of hers, who was also impossibly pregnant, Mary being far too young and Elizabeth being much too old. And this, significant, or this entanglement is just one of the many family resemblances that we see between John and Jesus. John's message when he got into his swing was not an easy one, but it didn't seem to matter because people sought him out in the wilderness. They wanted to be baptized by him in the Jordan River. And that's the second place where John's and Jesus' stories intersect and entangle. Jesus strolls up to John and asks to be baptized along with the rest of the crowds there in the Jordan. And in that moment, as the sun glinted off the water and Jesus was plunged under, John knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything he'd been teaching about, this was the one who was the one he'd been pointing to. That man was standing there in the river with him. Here and now was the fulfillment of everything John had taught. The day that Jesus came to be baptized, John knew this was the person that he was waiting for and everyone was waiting for. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then after John makes that declaration, he says this little phrase. John says, he must become greater, I must become less. And this comes to pass, but perhaps in a way that John did not quite intend. Because the next point of connection in the life of John and Jesus is this. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. So it's after John gets arrested that Jesus' ministry really gets going, 
And so for most of the time that Jesus is teaching and working miracles and drawing disciples and traveling, John is languishing in prison. And in fact, that's nearly the last time we hear about John the Baptist in Mark's gospel until we get here to Mark chapter 6, where we find out what has happened to John after he got arrested. This odd attraction that people have to John's message, as difficult as it is, it characterized Herod as well as the crowds who came to hear his message while he was in the desert baptizing in the Jordan. Herod arrested John, we learn here in Mark 6, because John publicly criticized his marriage to a woman that used to be his brother's wife. And he undertook that marriage, most historians think, to bolster his power in the region. John was not quite content to stay in his own lane and only talk about so-called religious or spiritual things. And he reminds Herod that he has done something that no Jewish person with even a passing familiarity with the laws of God in the Holy Scriptures should do. And the fact that John is popular with the people means that people actually care what he has to say And so Herod cannot risk the threat that John's opposition poses to his already precarious grip on power. For the record, this person, this Herod, is actually Herod Antipas. And he was known actually not so much for being a king, although he desperately wanted the title of king. He was a lesser known form of ruler. He was called a tetrarch, so he has a smaller slice of land and a smaller slice of people to rule over. Herod Antipas had nothing on his father, also known as Herod, so it gets really confusing. But that one was Herod the Great. And so Herod Antipas puts John in prison and keeps him there. And in the time when this story is told, prison wasn't so much a place that you went to serve out a sentence or a punishment. It was a place where you were held while you awaited your punishment. So the fact that Herod liked to listen to John at the same time extended his time in prison, and prison was not a nice place to be, but it also extended his life, because his final punishment wasn't carried out as long as he was being held. Herod likes to hear what John has to say, but he cannot release him, and so John's life is essentially in limbo for this entire time he's in prison. And the story about what ultimately happens to John the baptizer brings to mind for many commentators a number of stories from the Hebrew Bible in which a foolish king makes an oath that they should not have made and they're still somehow bound by the oath. They have to carry it out. This happens in the book of Daniel. The reason Daniel is put into the lion's den in the first place is because of the rash king who makes a law and then cannot repeal his own law, and so he's forced to put Daniel into the pit. Similarly, in the story of the people we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but whose proper Hebrew names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they wind up in that fiery furnace because of a hasty law enacted by a king who cannot then reverse the law. The same thing plays out in Esther as well. And so it is here with Herod the Tetrarch, who desperately wants to be king, this foolish ruler narrative plays itself out once again. Herod makes an oath to his wife's daughter, who has danced for his company and greatly pleased everyone. And she asks for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And it is gruesome. This is a gruesome story. And it is terrible. And even though it grieves Herod terribly, we read that he was greatly distressed, exceedingly sorry, distraught, deeply grieved, This is a word that's used in the New Testament one other time, and that's to refer to what Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he goes to the cross. So even though Herod is distressed, he still goes through with it. And apparently this has been haunting Herod ever since. Because when Jesus and his deeds become well known, this triggers something in Herod. Others have picked up on the family resemblance between John and Jesus. Rumors are going around that Jesus might just be John the Baptist raised from the dead. And Herod seizes on this. 
And as the stories about Jesus become more numerous and the crowds become more enamored of him, Herod is more and more paranoid, repeating to himself, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. There's something about Jesus that reminds everyone of John the Baptist, and Herod is haunted by it. John's story casts a long shadow, for he was a man of significance. And we cannot help but notice another family resemblance between John and Jesus. The last we hear about John the Baptist in the Gospel of Mark is this. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Given this resemblance between Jesus and John, we might wonder, even at this early point in the story, we're not even halfway yet through Mark's Gospel, if Jesus needs to fear a grave as well. Nonetheless, I want to contend that John's tomb is actually not the end of John's story. Now that John's life has ended, we might recall how it began. Like Jesus' life, John's birth was an unexpected miracle. It was announced to his startled father by an angel. And when John was born, his father, Zechariah, sings a prophecy over him. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. You will go ahead of the Master to prepare his way. You will present the off- he will present the offer of salvation to his people, the forgiveness of sins. Through the heartfelt mercies of our God, God's sunrise will break upon us, shining down on those in the darkness of the shadow of death, then showing us the way, one foot at a time, down the path of peace. So John's job was to point a spotlight and illuminate the one who becomes known as the light of the world, Jesus. And we knew this, and John knew this from the moment he was born. I could not put this any better than Jan Richardson, so I'm going to quote her here. She writes, Death does not have the last word in John's story. Blood is not the final legacy of the baptizer. John had succeeded in making a way for the dawn that his father sang about at his birth. The one who came as a witness to testify to the light had completed his purpose and his call, giving himself with complete abandon. He himself was not the light, the Gospel of John points out, and yet the Baptist shimmered with a steadfast purpose and with the joy that marked his life from the moment he met Jesus. So John's story does not truly end when they laid him in the grave because John fulfilled his purpose. He played his role to perfection. Such was the spotlight that John shone on Jesus that at one time in Jesus' life and ministry, when Jesus was quite vulnerable, he just evaded arrest, we read that Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John first baptized and stayed there. A lot of people followed him over, and they were saying, John did no miracles, but everything he said about Jesus has come true. And many believed in Jesus then and there. John spent his life shining the spotlight on Jesus, and because of that, many people followed Jesus. Now, the way that the writer of the Gospel of Mark arranges this particular story is quite fascinating. One of the things that Mark likes to do sometimes is to link two stories by arranging them together in what's known as a story sandwich. So one part of the story is told, and then there's another story in the middle, and then the end of the first story. And that's actually what's going on here in Mark 6. The story began with Jesus in his hometown, after which he sends out his disciples to show the kind of power that Jesus has demonstrated. And right in the middle of the story of what's going on with the disciples when they are sent out, before they come back and report to Jesus, we get this story of John the Baptist and what happens to him after he was imprisoned. And that's quite fascinating that it is here because the story is actually told as a flashback. It's already happened. This story could have been put anywhere in the gospel, but no, it's found here in the middle of a story about Jesus sending his disciples out to a rather surprising success. 
And I wonder if Mark didn't perhaps put John's story here in the middle of the disciples being sent out because John the Baptist shows what it means to live a life of significance. The narrative about the foolish King Herod tells us that he is bound to do what he does to John because of all the VIPs and the who's who, all the brass and blue bloods in Galilee who are in attendance at his birthday party. These men are important. They're so important that Herod doesn't want to go back on the oath he made in front of them. And Herod fancies himself quite important as well. But John, by contrast, was significant. So significant that his words about Jesus last long after he's been killed. So significant that Herod cannot seem to get John out of his mind. He believes Jesus is John come back from the dead. That's how powerful the memory of John was. And Jesus' disciples, the ones that Jesus sends out with the kind of authority that he has, their story is bisected by this memory of what happened to the one known as the baptizer. Do these disciples want to be important? like Herod and all his officials? Or do they want to be popular? Or do they want to have significance, lasting significance, by doing the will and the work and following in the footsteps of Jesus, by shining a spotlight on Jesus, whose story and significance also, like John's, goes far beyond the days when he walked the earth. Herod is a mere footnote in the story of Jesus, whose story is still being told and whose name is still being proclaimed and whose life and ministry and death and resurrection are still changing lives and saving the people the world over some centuries after he lived. Might we too, we students and disciples of Jesus, find our significance in following the carpenter, in shining a spotlight on Jesus, whose kingdom is so pervasive and invasive that it still lasts today. That's the difference between importance and significance. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Holy God, we thank you for people who pointed the way to you. Because of the witness of others, we have found our way to you, and you have called us to follow you, and for this we thank you. We pray that you would help us to find our significance in you, that we would spend our lives giving you glory, that many more may know about your goodness and your love. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you go this week, you go to fulfill Christ's ministry, bringing good news and healing to the world God so loves. Trust where God is sending you. Rely on the gifts the Spirit gives you and look for the presence of Christ, the living word, in each place. And as you go, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the partnership of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace.